must never forget that what, what is most important for man to do in order to be saved is where Satan will certainly do some of his best work to deceive men. Highly esteemed listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday 5.30 a.m. on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Shall we commit ourselves to the Almighty? We bless you, we adore you, O Jehovah God Almighty, creator of the universe, mankind, and all that there is. We bless you once again for your mercies on our lives, that by your grace you've ushered us into the portion of the living this day. We magnify and exalt your holy name for your protection, and give you the opportunity you are calling us to listen to your priceless words. We pray that, Father, you forgive us all our sins we've committed against you in thought, in ashes, and deeds, that you speak through us and grant us house of understanding to be able to understand your words, which will be able to help us in this life and the life to come. Once again, we are asking that you continue to grant your technical ability to the technicians, O Lord, that they may be able to transmit your oracles unadulterated to your audience, Begin and end successful with us in the name above all names. Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hi, yes, still listeners. We continue for a series of lessons we draw from the theme, rightly dividing the word of truth, and especially with the topic of the New Testament and with the subtopic of baptism. We have come thus far and we've learned that the last time we met, we understood that there are some prerequisites that is required for one to be a proper candidate of baptism. And therefore, it is not anybody at all, any human being at all, right from babies up to the no, but the specific candidate, and for you to be a candidate, we looked at certain things like the need for one to be taught, the need for one to believe, the need for one to repent, and the need for one to obey. These are prerequisites in all the circumstances of baptism that we've come across in the Word of God. And so today we continue by looking at some household conversions and conclude with that part regarding proper candidate for baptism. We want to look at baptism and household conversions because some claim that since there were household conventions. They might have included people that we are saying that are not proper candidates, especially babies, etc., because household includes all. And we think that that will be an unfortunate interpretation of the scriptures for the fact that the Bible is saying that there were household conventions. Doesn't mean that it needs to continue to repetitively point out that this is not necessary before they did it, before they did that, that, no, it is not like that. So I want to look at briefly baptism and household conversion that we have in the scriptures. And we want to emphasize that baptism of infants as it's a widespread practice among several religious groups is on the increase. This has been a practice that has existed for centuries. It is a practice that has a strong emotional hold on the religious thinking of many parents concerning their newborn infants. It is important, therefore, to study this subject in relation to what the Bible teaches. If this practice is biblical, then certainly it should be a part of the religious belief and practice of all who seek to obey God. However, if this teaching is simply a traditional practice that has been bound on the consciences of sincere parents, then we must reject it are simply a traditional teaching of men. The seriousness, the baptism of men and women have been emphasized in the scriptures, but not with infants. In order to answer those who promote infant baptism, it is imperative to first understand who was baptized in the New Testament. When we study the New Testament cases of immersion, we discover those who were baptized that they were adult men and women. The emphasis in conversion was on those who sincerely recognized 
their accountability to God. Those who recognized their accountability were those who could discern between right and wrong when they heard the word of God preached concerning their accountability before God. Luke recorded in Acts chapter 5 verse 14, Acts 5 14, that believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitude of both men and women, of both men and women. In Samaria, Philip preached in order to appeal to adults. Luke wrote of what took place after Philip's preaching in Samaria. In Acts chapter 8 verse 12, Acts 8 verse 12, and I read, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Unquote. When Saul persecuted the church, he imprisoned only those who were of the way. Who were of the way. This included only men and women. Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Acts 9, 2. No infants were baptized nor imprisoned for being of the way. Those baptized in the first century were accountable individuals who had responded to the preaching of the gospel. Both in Acts 5 verse 14 and Acts 8 12, men and women are specifically mentioned as those who were immersed. It is significant that the inspired writers made specific mention of men and women. We wonder why such would have been stated if infants were included in these cases of immersion. By simply reading the narrative, the obvious conclusion will be that no infants were included in these immersions. The Holy Spirit wanted us to understand that only accountable men and women were baptized. Distinguished listeners, it was somewhat prophetic of the Holy Spirit to mention in these particular cases of baptism that only men and women were baptized. He possibly knew that the time would come when infant baptism would be introduced as a substitute for the immersion of believing men and women. He thus made it perfectly clear that only men and women were baptized in the first century. Distinguished listeners, let us therefore look at some of the cases of household baptisms we have in the Bible. In the New Testament, there were several household baptisms. These were baptisms of entire families, including the servants who were included as part of a household. Those who support the practice of infant baptism today believe and think that these were infants in this household baptism of the book of Acts. But this is an unjustified deduction. There is no proof that there were babies in the baptism of these households. A brief survey of what took place in the household baptisms in the New Testament clearly teaches that no infants were involved in the baptisms. For instance, case number one, the household of Lydia. The household of Lydia, this can be located in Acts chapter 16 verses 14 and 15. Acts 16, 14 and 15. This household baptism is not justification for this baptism of infants. We cannot assume that there were infants in the household of Lydia for the following reasons. One, no infants are mentioned. No infants are mentioned. Two, those who were baptized in the passage were those who gave heed, who gave heed or attended to the things that Paul preached. Infants cannot give attention to things that are spoken concerning their salvation. Three, to say that infants were included in this baptism, we would have to assume that Lydia was married. There is no indication in the text that she was married. We would also have to assume that she had infant children. And we will have to assume again that she had her children with her. Remember, Lydia was about 400 kilometers away from her home, which was in the city of Fiatra. 
the same restlessness. So case number one will never support infant baptism of the household baptism of Lydia that we had. Case number two, the household of the Philippian jailer. The household of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 verses 30 to 34. Acts chapter 16 verse 30 to 34. We cannot assume that there were infants in this household baptism also for the following reasons. One, no infants are mentioned to all who were baptized in this household were able to hear and understand according to the scripture the word of the Lord. Three, those of this household were also able to believe on the Lord Jesus before their baptism. And for those who were baptized, the passage stated that they rejoiced greatly after their baptism. Infants can do none of these things. Therefore, we must rightly conclude that there were no infants in the household of the Philippian jailer where he was baptized. Case number three, the household of Cornelius. The household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 11. In Acts 10 and Acts 11, we read of the baptism of Cornelius. We cannot assume that those who were, there were infants in this household also. This is true for the following reasons. One, no infants are mentioned. Two, all of Cornelius' house heard God. Three, all who were baptized in Cornelius' house were able to do the following. According to the passage in Acts 10, they were able to hear the word in Acts 10, 44. They were able to speak with languages, Acts 10, 46. And they were able to magnify God in Acts 10, 46. Distinguished listeners, infants can do none of these things. Therefore, we must conclude that there were no infants baptized when the household of Cornelius was baptized. Case number four, the household of Stephanus. The household of Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 1, 16, and also 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. The following two points will not allow infants to be included in the baptism of of the household of Stephanus. One, no infants are mentioned. And two, 1 Corinthians 16 15 states that Stephanus' household, quote, devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, unquote. If we assume that infants were included in the household baptism of 1 Corinthians 1 16, then we could also assume that. Corinth had ministering infants. Ministering infants. Because in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, that is what it says. That they ministered. The church in Corinth had no ministering infants. And thus, we must conclude that no infants were included in the household baptism of Stephanos in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 16. Highly esteemed listeners. In order to make a correct inference from a passage of scripture that does not specifically identify the inference, that which is inferred must be clearly taught by either declarative or imperative statements in other passages so that we could use even that. For example, Jesus made a declarative statement concerning belief in John chapter 8 verse 24. John 8.24, and I quote, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unquote. In this verse, there is a declarative statement of Jesus. He said nothing concerning repentance. However, we could correctly infer that repentance is required in conjunction with the requirement of belief in order that one not die in a sense. We can make this assumption simply because repentance is clearly stated in declarative and imperative statement in other context. Because Peter stated that the Lord is more willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 
2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. This declarative statement in conjunction with John 8.24 makes repentance a correct inference in Jesus' requirement that one believe. The sinlessness, this brings us to the practice of infant baptism in reference to the cases of household baptisms in the New Testament. The point is that before one can correctly infer that there were infants in the preceding cases of household baptisms, in which cases there is no specific mention of infants, there must be decorative or imperative statements in other contexts that require infants to be baptized. The difficulty facing the proposed system of infant baptism is the complete silence of the scriptures on this matter. There are absolutely no statements throughout the entire Bible concerning the practice of infant baptism. To practice such is thus an addition to the word of God. If one binds the practice of the consciences of men, then he is adding to, to that which God requires of one to be saved. The sinlessness. So that is about that. Again, we need to emphasize that infant baptism is not authorized by the Bible at all. Infant baptism is not authorized by the Bible at all. It is a serious thing to add to God's word and bind on the consciences of religious people those things that God does not bind. The principle John stated in Revelation chapter 22 verse 18 is applicable to the subject under discussion here. John warned, and I quote, If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Unquote. Infant baptism is an addition to that which God requires of men to obey in order to be saved. It is an addition simply because there is no scripture that binds such on the consciences of men. Since there is no scripture binding such on men, then we must conclude that such is not necessary for salvation, but is simply a religious tradition of men. The fact that infant baptism is not found in the Bible is a major argument against its practice as a binding command. As in Revelation 22 verse 18, the New Testament makes several other warnings against adding to the religious practices which God desires that men do. Paul exhorted that we should learn not to think beyond what is written. Not to think beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. In his letter to the Galatians, he warned the Christians there not to be turned aside to another gospel. For he wrote, and I quote, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Unquote. That's Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. Galatians 1 8. The problem in the Galatian church was that those were those who were binding on the Galatian Christians things that God had not bound. They were making such unbound rules a legal requirement for salvation. But doing this is inventing another gospel after the traditions of men. The same the message that was first preached 2,000 years ago contained absolutely nothing concerning infant baptism. Adding this practice to Christianity as a binding religious law would be going beyond the authority of the scriptures. In 2 John 9, 2 John 9, John adds, to the anathema Paul pronounced in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Concerning those who will add to God's ways, John wrote, and I quote, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Unquote. To practice infant baptism, is to go beyond the teaching of Christ. For Christ said nothing about it. The entire Bible says nothing about it. 
Those who teach infant baptism as a religious practice have no Bible authority for doing such. Distinguishedness. When you want to look at the testimony of religious scholarship, the testimony of religious scholarship, religious scholarship confirms that the practice of infant baptism originated after the first century concerning this thought. It is interesting to note the comments of origin, origin, a historian, between 185 to 254 AD, 185 to 254 AD on this subject. He stated the following. Having occasion given in this place, I will intensify a thing that causes frequent inquiries among the brethren. Infants are baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Of what sins? Or where they have sinned? Or how can any reason of the saved in the case hold good? But according to that sense, we mention even now, man is free from pollution, though his life be but the length of one ray upon the earth, and it is for that reason, because of the sacrament of baptism, that pollution of our birth is made away. The infants we baptize. That is, he wrote this in his works, volume 1. Works, volume 1. This is one of the first statements that was made in history on the subject of infant baptism. This is indeed an early statement concerning the practice of infant baptism. However, what is important to note in church history is that there is no mention of any kind of infant baptism that dates to the first century. Many religious leaders who practice infant baptism are honest in their admission that their practice did not originate in the New Testament times. The Catholic religious leader, Bertrand Conway, Bertrand Conway wrote that there is no express mention of the baptizing of infants in the New Testament. Unquote. He wrote this in the question, in the question, box P155. 155. In the Catholic book, Teachings of the Catholic Church, it is also stated in the Catholic book, Teachings of the Catholic Church, that the baptism of infants is not positively directed in the gospel. Unquote. This one also can be found, it was quoted in the question, the question box, the question box, page 23, the question box. Such an admission should urge all those who practice infant baptism to make, take heed in light of what is said in Galatians 1, verse 6 through 9, and Revelation 22, 18 and 19, concerning God's judgment of those who will add to the word of God. God is serious about our not binding upon the consciences of men those things that he has not bound. If religious practices are bound upon men and claimed to have originated from God, the scriptures pronounce harsh condemnations upon those who would bind such man-made religious traditions. And biblical religious traditions that are bound on the consciences of men lead men to ignore the authority of God's word. When men ignore the authority of the word of God, they will create a religion after their own desires. And thus eventually, reject the commandments of God in order to keep those traditional laws. According to Mark chapter 7, verse 1 to 9. Mark 7, 1 to 9. The single listeners, once people are faithful to their traditions, they usually do not return to the authority of the law or of the word of God. They have set their course to maintain their own religion. Which religion is an invention of man. It is for this reason that we encourage people to reconsider their practice of infant baptism. Distinguished listeners, this is great news that we need to understand. In fact, baptism and infant salvation is nowhere to be declared. 
as we have already emphasized. Infant baptism is a major practice and belief in the religious world. Changing from this belief to the truth concerning true candidates for baptism is often quite difficult for parents. When one has been for generation in a religious group that has baptized infants, it is psychologically challenging to leave this tradition behind. For this reason, we must give some special attention to the nature of the soul of babies and their relationship to God. An important Bible teaching is the innocence of newly born babies. They are pure of sin and safe from condemnation. However, a truly false teaching has been developed by some religious groups that centers around the theology that babies are born sinners. Because of this belief, it is affirmed that infants must be baptized for the remission of sins. However, if we fully understand some simple truths, there will be no reason to believe in the necessity that babies be baptized because they are supposed sinners in the sight of God. Because infants are pure of sin. In the sight of God, infants are pure of sin and thus do not need to be baptized for the remission of sins. Pure of sin means they had no sin. They are not born sinners. Neither do they have the ability as infants to sin by voluntarily rejecting the word of God. Jesus used the innocence of little children to illustrate the nature of servanthood in the kingdom. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and became as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And this was stated in Matthew chapter 18 verse 3. Matthew 18 3. We wonder why Jesus will make this statement of children as a, a sinful of nature. Why will he illustrate the pure nature of the kingdom by that which is not pure? The answer to this question is that he will not do that. Jesus also said of little children, For of such is the kingdom of heaven, I quote, For of such is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 19 verse 14. The point is that the kingdom originates from heaven. It is the kingdom of heaven since it originates from heaven. Then it is pure. For all that originates from heaven is pure. It is not of sin. If we understand this point, then we can understand what Jesus is saying about the nature of infants and children until they reach the age at which they can make a choice concerning the will of God, they are not sinners. What he is saying is that the soul of infants is as pure as that from which their spirits originated. Since God, in whom there is no darkness, according to 1 John 1 verse 5, 1 John 1 5, is the father of our spirits, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 9, then we must conclude that there is absolutely no darkness in an infant at the time of birth. The same with listeners, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 verse 3. Being born again and becoming as little children refer to the same concept. When one is born of the water, baptism, then his, his sins are washed away. And one comes out of the grave of water as a new creature in order to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 to 6. At the point of immersion, one is washed of every sin and becomes pure as a little child. The kingdom of heaven is without sin. Jesus keeps the submitted subject of his kingdom continually cleansed of sin by his precious blood that he poured on Calvary. When one continues to allow the sovereign will of Jesus to rule in his or her heart by walking in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses to wash away all the sin continually. 
the very concept that one must be born anew assumes that in physical birth one is pure. Why should Jesus use the statement born anew? It is instruction to Nicodemus. If infants are with sin, when they are physically born, then why would Jesus ask him to be born anew? And we should be like little children. What Jesus was saying was that one must be born anew in order to become pure as an infant when the infant is newly born. One is cleansed of sin by immersion. He is born again to be pure as he was when first born as a baby. The kingdom is free of sin because of the continual cleansing work of the blood of Jesus. These basic New Testament teachings are based on the fact that children are pure of sin. And if children are pure of sin, they do not need to be baptized for the remission of sins. It is often argued that in Matthew chapter 19 verse 14, Matthew 19 14, Mark 10 15, Mark 10 15, and Luke 18 17, Jesus was urging the little children to come to him in order that they be baptized. But this is just not true. This is an unjustified assumption. It is an addition to the context. The word baptism is not mentioned in any of these three chapters. It is not given under consideration at all. In order for one to make the assumption that Jesus was urging children to come to him for baptism, he must first find such a teaching in the creative or imperative statement somewhere in other contexts of the New Testament. The fact is that there are absolutely no other statements concerning infant baptism throughout the entire New Testament. Because infants are safe from condemnation. Brethren, with this, it is important for us to understand that there is no justification for infant baptism. All that we are trying to do is to remind ourselves to go back to the old path Jesus has set for us for salvation. All that we are saying is that it's not difficult to follow the commands of Jesus. And even with this very important aspect of our covenant relationship with Jesus and baptism being a key principle, we should never narrate and joke with it. Let us go back and do exactly what is expected of us. Because there are certain prerequisites that are very necessary for one to be a proper candidate of baptism. Infants are clean, pure of sin. God created man as a free moral agent. And therefore he never asks us to do things when we are not able to exercise our free moral agency. Adam and Eve, by the time he was born, were men free of moral agency, the kutus. And that is why everything that they did was accountable. Babies that came after have to wait until they reach the age of accountability. God created us in his own image as a free moral agent, knowing good and bad. And therefore will never condemn any baby who never know good and bad at that age to be accountable or to be condemned. This is not a kind of God, the kind of God that we serve. And so infants are pure of sin, please and please. And therefore we need not to deceive ourselves by thinking that infants should be baptized. And when we do the right thing, God will continue to help us. May God continue to bless us and open our understanding in this series of lessons that we may be able to stand and do right and be blessed by the Almighty God and be saved. God willing, next week we shall continue once again. This has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m. on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Make a date with that same time, God willing, next week, as God continues to unravel his priceless oracles, you may want to contact us on 024-5527-658 or send us a message on coc.radio at yahoo.com coc.radio at yahoo.com We are also located on Facebook at Church Radio. Church Radio. I am your brother Eric Dako. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through May our own spirits, soul, 
souls and bodies become blameless at the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we we'll meet again. Stay richly blessed. Amen and good morning. Oh.